to the kill count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at The Rage Carry 2, released in 1999. It's always hard to make a sequel to a classic, especially when it comes out 23 years after the original. And in the opinion of most people, The Rage is an absolute failure. But I've got to admit, even though I didn't grow up watching it or anything, I've got a weird soft spot for this movie. If only because it serves as a perfect time capsule of 1999. As evidenced by a cast that includes Mena Suvari and one of the kids from Home and Freak Improvement. Oh, and also the soundtrack, which is just like 55 minutes of pure nostalgia, man. But there's other stuff to enjoy here, too. I love that Amy Irving returns as Sue Snell, and Emily Burgle is great in a role that bounces back and forth between vulnerable and badass. And even though they don't deal with it in the most subtle way, I'll give this movie some credit for trying to tackle a contemporary social issue, with the plot based in part on a real-life 1993 scandal involving a group of high schoolers called the Spur Posse. The Rage may not be a good movie, and if you compare it to the original, it's gonna look bad every time. But on its own, I like its depiction of angst and Generation X. But I repeat myself. If none of what I just said is convincing, though, you've at least got to give the movie credit for its balls-to-the-walls final sequence, which gets so buckwild and graphic, I had to get a sponsor for today's episode so I can show you all the good stuff. Total AV is a way to keep your PC and Mac safe from malware, ransomware, spyware, and all the other badwares out there trying to get you. Total AV's elite antivirus protection can be used on all of your devices, including your cell phone, to encrypt your browsing data and keep you safe from phony phishing sites or viruses that try to steal your information. It runs in the background, so it won't interfere with your everyday activity, and it even includes a VPN to help make you anonymous as you surf the web. So don't leave yourself with 1999 levels of internet security. Browse safely and securely by going to TotalAV.com slash DeadMeatJames and get Total AV for just $29.99 a year. That's 70% off its retail price. That's TotalAV.com slash DeadMeatJames for internet security and VPN at less than 30 bucks a year. You can't beat that deal, not even with secret mind powers. Can a party scene massacre top a senior prom slaughter? I'll figure that out for you by counting up these kills. The movie begins with a paintbrush making a nice red path towards a title card! This paint is getting all over everything in this house thanks to Barbara Lang, who tells some unseen force to stay away from her black and white daughter Rachel. Oh and hey Rachel, what did the red paintbrush say to the face? Slap! That kind of joke don't fly with social services, so Barbara is taken away, leaving Rachel by her lonesome since I don't have a dad. Upset, Rachel storms inside and starts slamming doors behind her in a long tracking shot that I really dig. Even if you can see the stick through the wall that closes the first door there. I'm not as much a fan of the black and white music video shots though, that show windows opening and closing thanks to Rachel's rage, something she doesn't have much control over. <laughs> 13 years later, Rachel is the kind of alt-crowd pissed off kid who wakes up to music like this. <laughs> She lives with her droopy good boy, Walt, and her foster parents, Boyd and Emmeline. And when Boyd's not busy headlining blue-collar comedy tours, he's demanding Rachel respect them and the rules of their house. Rachel is played by Emily Burgle in her film debut, kicking off a career that would include roles in Shameless and Mindhunter, as well as a gig singing Cabaret. Fun! Rachel's best friend, Lisa, played by Mena Suvari, is in a real special mood today, having just lost her virginity over the weekend. And to whom? Well, I'll tell Tell ya, just as soon as they get to school with some 90s appropriate third wave ska. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Just what I wanted. Looks like Lisa was drilled by this son of a tool man, Eric Stark, who's part of a group of bros who keep a ranking system for their sex capades. How many points do I get if I do that trick over there? The fat one? Six. No, bro, I did her last week and you only gave me five, and she's not fat. The bro leader is Mark Bing, who calls Rachel and Lisa ugly, meaning he's more of a dick than reluctant bro Jesse Ryan, who's a little dazed and confused about how brotastic he has to be. Finally, the B-tier bros are Brad Winters and Chuck Potter. The latter, played by Eli Craig, who would end up writing and directing Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. Which, yes, I'll cover one day. Be patient, damn it. Lisa is still keeping the identity of her paramour a secret, though, meaning Rachel has no idea who it is when, later that day, Lisa somberly steps 
steps out onto the school roof and without hesitation walks right off the edge. She free falls in a pretty great stunt down onto a car windshield and dies. The student body crowds the student's body and when Rachel sees what happened, she has a black and white psychic freak out that blows open a whole bunch of lockers all around the school. Guidance counselor Sue Snell is summoned and pulls Rachel away from the scene with care. Sue tries to comfort Rachel even though the girl can't sad right. I don't cry. She'd much rather run through the woods looking like an impressionist painting. Meanwhile, Eric is afraid of being blamed for Lisa's suicide, since she did it after he coldly rejected her. Lisa was acting all happy, you know, like we were going steady. You know, and I had to break the news to her that she, she was just a pump. Worried about losing his potential football scholarship, especially since Lisa took a picture of them together, he asks Mark to help him cover his ass, and the bro obliges. They're gonna have a hard time getting that picture back, though, since Rachel works at the photo development uh, kiosk, or whatever that thing is. To persuade her to help him, Mark brings Jesse along, since earlier, in a scene riffing off the original, he showed how sensitive and romantic he is. Romeo and Juliet really isn't a tragedy because the only way they could be together wasn't death. Yes! Yo, that teacher's pumped about Willy Shakes. Despite breaking out the hunk guns, Mark is told the to fuck off by Rachel, who then goes through the pictures herself and finds the one of Lisa and Eric together. She takes it to Sheriff Kelton, who earlier had found Lisa's suicide note, which mentioned Eric's rejection. Sue Snell tells the sheriff that a whole bunch of other girls have told her the same thing, that Eric and his bros are on a humping and dumping spree, so she wants Eric to be charged with something. Eric is 18. Lisa was 16, that's statutory rape. The sheriff's reluctant to make the charge, though, and says Sue might just be trying to make herself feel better about that time she told Carrie White to plug it up, plug it up. Jesse sleeps with his ex-girlfriend, a popular cheerleader named Tracy, in his car. But wait a minute, all his friends were just sitting there the whole time, waiting to score the scoring? Come on, Tracy, you didn't see them or hear their 90s music? Yeah! <laughs> They're playing it loud as hell! Tracy's hearing must be about as good as her caring, since she don't give a damn about Lisa's suicide. She wasn't anybody. Is this really the crowd you want to hang out with, Jesse? Protagonist or brotagonist, dog? Pick one. That night, Rachel has a hard time controlling her shaky rage, which is only apt to get worse after Walt runs away from the house. I don't think this is gonna end well, judging by that tragic alt-rock on the soundtrack. That is not good news. More tragedies in store for Rachel, but I'm not gonna show the worst shot of this dog getting hit by a truck, cause they seriously have one of it getting straight dragged under them tires. Nobody wants to see that. Rachel rages out and stops Jesse's car in the road right as he happened to be driving by. He takes her and Walt to the vet because, thankfully, that trampled good boy ain't dead. While Walt's getting treated, the two of them head to a diner, and despite all that dog blood soaking Rachel's clothes, they're able to decompress and have a good time talking about 90s music. Don't they have anything good? Like some garbage? You like garbage? Oh yeah, Shirley Manson, she rocks. They bond over how they're both only happy when it rains, and after expressing sympathy to Rachel for Lisa's death, Jesse drops her back off at home. Rachel has a night of bad dreams filled with desaturated suicides, which is maybe why she meets with guidance counselor Sue Snell the next day. Sue really tries to reach out to Rachel, but Rachel grows angry and slides a mug off the desk with her mind. I'm sorry. I must have knocked it. <laughs> yeah, try that shit on Sue Snell. Fool Snell once, shame on you. Fool Snell twice, shame on Sue. At football practice, we see that there's a whole cycle of sexual abuse going on, as Coach Walsh makes Mark drop trow in front of his team so he can berate him with a tampon joke. After that half-ass block, I just wanted to check to see if maybe you had a tampon string hanging between your legs. Now, is that any way to treat people, coach? What would your father say? After Stephen Ford's father, of course, being Gerald friggin' Ford, 38th president of the United States? What? Sheriff Kelton comes to practice and confronts Eric about that picture with Lisa. He winds up getting suspended and might even get that statutory rape charge. But the worst thing of all is that he's gonna have to miss the big football game. Football scouts are gonna be there from everywhere and I'm gonna be sitting on the bench with a thumb up my ass. 
Oh, you're hoping to get scouted by the brown thumbs, huh? Mark and Eric decide that they'll intimidate Rachel to stop her from telling more people about what he did. So that night, as Rachel's getting ready to go out with Jesse, they visit her with black and white camcorders, apparently, and harass her through noises, flashlights, and phone calls where Donald Duck promotes my other video series. Watch your favorite scary movie. Episode 4 with Red is out tomorrow. Things get more criminal, and the bros start to bro out of control until Rachel slams a window on Eric's hand and sends them scurrying away. At school, as Rachel tells Jesse what happened, his ex-girlfriend Tracy gets pissed, even as her best friend Monica tries to keep her spirits up. Your caviar, she's cheese whiz. I don't think actor Rachel Blanchard has ever actually used cheese whiz before, because that was a clueless pronunciation of it. Cheese whiz. It's it's just cheese whiz. It's not cheese whiz. Jesse confronts Mark about their scare tactics, and the two of them get into a locker room scuffle before they're torn apart from each other in a real broton splitting. Then we get a bunch of stuff that hammers home how this is a sequel to Carrie. Another attempt by Sue for peace, another telekinetic explosion, and another flashback to the first movie. <laughs> Originally, the filmmakers weren't going to be able to use Sissy Spacex likeness, but director Kat Shea put shots of her in anyway, then asked the actor herself for approval, which Spacex gave her. Jesse and Rachel have a car hood park date until a sudden rainstorm forces them inside the vehicle, where things can get a little more porn music-y. With those sweet guitar strums, how can they help but suck face? They go at it pretty hard until she stops and tells him she's a virgin, and she wants her first time to be something special, something with flowers. What kind of flowers do you like? Daisies. Sue Snell visits the psych ward where Rachel's mother Barbara is held, a place called Arkham like there's a goddamn joker running around. Even if there was, though, I bet Barbara Lang could take care of him. <laughs> Good thing she's learning that authoritative tone now. Roman Roy is really gonna appreciate it 20 years later. Turns out Barbara's a recovering Margaret White, having previously blamed Rachel's powers on devil man possession. Sue tells her instead that there's a gene behind the scenes but that the male is the carrier. So she needs to know who Rachel's father was. The answer isn't exactly a surprise. His name was Ralph. White. Making Rachel Carrie's half-sister. Sue reaches out to Rachel once more, this time beginning with some vital information. Night of the prom. 73 people died. Thanks again for that intel, Ms. Snell. In Snell? She shows her the remains of the high school Carrie burned down and tells Rachel she knows that she has the same kind of power. It's a trait, Rachel, you've inherited. Telekinesis. The ability to move objects with your mind. Rachel doesn't want to hear about this, though, and rejects Sue's offer of Snell, er, help. Eric's dad, a lawyer, fights the statutory claim by saying that if Eric goes down, the whole football team will go down with him. You want to be responsible for ruining these boys' lives? Though the deputy DA, played by director Kat Shea, still wants to press charges, the senior DA shoots her down, since he's a friend of Eric's dad. Oh, fuck off, dude. By the way, Kat Shea isn't just in that role out of vanity. She started her career as an actor, and was even in Psycho 3 before directing movies like Strip to Kill and Dance of the Damned for Roger Corman, under whom she came up. She wasn't the first director attached to Carrie 2, and when she got the gig, she only had a week to prepare before production began. That is not a lot of time. Jesse asks Rachel to come to the trademark big football game so she can give him some luck and make him play better. While getting makeup at the mall, Rachel runs into Tracy's friend Monica, who begins feigning a friendship as part of a plot to humiliate her. Mark's also in on this plot, which is why he apologizes to Jesse and offers him the keys to his parents' condo. Sounds like the perfect place to have a special night together. So Rachel gets ready and dresses in her finest blue dress when Jesse comes to pick her up, daisies and all. They go to the condo and get straight to necking and eventually dissolve into a sappy lovemaking sesh, never noticing that there had been someone outside their window the whole time. The next day, the football team, minus Jesse, psychs themselves up by shaving their heads, super pumped to go out there and get concussions. Rachel, who got slapped and grounded by Boyd for coming home late, almost misses the game. But at the last minute, she sneaks out and arrives, um, right on the fucking 
fucking field, I guess, to give Jesse the luck or whatever to make a crucial final play and win the game. Football! During all this, Sue Snell, hoping to get Rachel to listen to her, breaks Barbara out of Arkham using gum, a simple distraction, and some wacky keyboard music. Okay then. With Jesse busy talking to a scout, Rachel is left heading to Mark's party without him, getting driven there by Monica as John Flansburg's side project Mono Puff plays a very on the nose song. Backstabbing my Jesse comes out to the parking lot later to find his Jeep vandalized, so he's forced to hitch a ride with Tracy, not knowing that she was actually the saboteur. Mark's house is party damn central, but Rachel doesn't exactly get the warmest welcome from the crowd. Awkward! Mark and the bros apologize to Rachel for that time they terrorized her in her home, which keeps Rachel calm as Tracy distracts Jesse at her house by any means necessary. He's not into it though. Yeah, we're gonna be late. Yeah, dude. You wouldn't want to be late to a party playing a rockabilly song called 13 Cats by a band also called 13 Cats. 13, 13, 13 cats. Yes, I love the songs in this movie, even though that one's not on the soundtrack. While Rachel's cutting loose to that baker's dozen of cats, Mark sets up their prank, which is much more digital than a mere bucket of blood. They drop their pretend niceness to Rachel and reveal their scoring system, cruelly reveling in the fact that Lisa was just a couple of points to them. Well, to be honest, I just about split her in two. <laughs> They imply that Jesse only slept with her to win the game, and it's a uh, fucked up situation all around. It only gets worse when they play a tape they recorded of the night she and Jesse had sex, implying that he was in on this whole damn thing. It's time for a telekinetic massacre, so we might as well start with a Margaret White remix and some seriously insane stylistic decisions. Jesus, movie, chill out for a mo. Rachel begins her raging by slamming the door shut and growing a very stupid henna tattoo all over her face and body. And then things get killy. And this is one of those frame-by-frame -frame mofos, so just I'll do my best here, all right? It doesn't help that all those morons shave their heads before this either. <laughs> Rachel blows out the huge windows and kills two dudes right away. Chuck Potter with a decapitation and a random guy with a very splurty neck wound. Most everyone else is still alive and moving right now, but I will count as dead this chick Brad Winter steps on while running away. Bleeding out the mouth like that's usually not a good sign of living. Having gotten wind of the party, Sue Snell and Barbara arrive just in time for tragedy, as Sue gets impaled, along with Brad on the other side of the door, by a fire poker going going through their heads. At least we know for whom the Snell tolls. As Rachel's mom Barbara enters the party, another mean party girl gets killed by CDs. Cause this is 1999, motherfuckers. Though I will say Hellraiser 3 did it first in 92. I'm gonna count people on fire as dead, so let's add another seven to the count right now. Four people I see on fire inside, one lady who yells hilariously Please, somebody put me up! Before she manages to get outside, a dude who catches fire from her flames and gets trapped inside the gate, and a bald dude near the door who also catches fire. The main baddies break into Mark's dad's room and arm themselves since they realize that Rachel's to blame for all this, making Monica more afraid of her than she is of the dark. Speaking of Rachel the scary murderer, I'll count the seven people lying in front of her as new victims. Even though the number of bodies might be changing between different overhead shots, I am counting the dude by the wall though. Don't worry. I was gonna put eight bodies here, but turns out this guy I saw in the lower right corner of the frame is just a crew member. I think spraying flame retardant on the extras there. The things you find counting kills, I tell ya. As Barbara prays, Rachel walks in black and white towards her primary antagonist, who won't let something silly like a glass window stop them from getting outside. They make their stand in front of the pool, but before they can pull the trigger on their plan, Rachel uses her powers to burst Monica's glasses and kill her and Eric together, since he gets spear gunned through the groin. Monica dies of bloody eyes, and I think Eric maybe just got fully castrated there. Mark, who couldn't save his buddy's privates, shoots a flare into Rachel's side, which knocks her into the pool all bloody and burnt. But she jumps up and pulls him in after her, and after the automatic pool cover knocks him silly, Mark is left to drown beneath the tarp as Rachel cuts her way out and escapes to freedom. Sorry about that, Mark, but at least he got a nice long death shot out of the deal. 
video. That's something, right? Rachel is found and then rejected by her mother. I guess for, um, not being a little girl still? I don't know, man. In retrospect, the entire subplot with her mom was pretty fucking pointless. All it did was get Sue Snell killed. Rachel is left on the deck of Mark's pool, begging God to let her die until she hears Jesse calling for her from inside. Oh, wait, shit, is that a new body? I guess I'll count it as another kill. I can't discern the gender of that burnt up corpse, though. Sorry. Rachel comes inside and sees Tracy, whom she promptly murders with a falling flaming ceiling beam. But I'm not gonna count all these other bodies around Tracy, because I think they're part of the seven I counted before who were lined up in front of Rachel. Besides, doesn't sound like these deaths even matter that much to Jesse. Come on, she's dead. They're all dead. We have to get out of here. Let's go. Rachel yells at Jesse for the sex tape in the bang book, even though he denies any involvement with what happened. When she sees on the sex tape that he said I love you to her while she was sleeping, she finally believes him, which is why she throws him out of the way as a big old chunk of ceiling falls. He is saved, but she's crushed, and she weakly tells him to go on and get. Jesse doesn't want to leave her, but since she has TK, it gives her the final say. So, bye! <laughs> looks like he's on a waterbed. One year later, at King's, maybe Stephen King's University, Jesse's got a burnt-ass arm and Rachel's good boy Walt with him. And a blue dress wearing visitor in the form of Rachel. Ha <laughs> ha, they're together! That's nice. I love a happy ending. Just kidding, motherfuckers! Have a horrifying jump scare! Rachel, in fact, died in that fire. I just wanted to give y'all a proper scare. Cause like, holy shit, man. You just don't expect that from this movie, right? How many people died in the Rage Carry 2? I don't really know, cause they just threw a bunch of dummies all over a house fire. But I'll tell you my best guess at the numbers. Let's go! By my count, 27 people died in the Rage Carry 2, with 13 victims identifiably female, 13 identifiably male, and one unidentifiable, which at least makes for some decent symmetry, you know? With a runtime of 105 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 3.89 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to the twofer of Monica and Eric. Even with the 90s CG, it's pretty graphic, and that spear gun through the groin is something nasty. Damn. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to Mark, since he just drowned in a pool. Don't drink and swim, kids. And that's it. The Rage Carry 2 came out in 1999, and although I kinda like it, Stephen King was not a fan. On Sunday, we've got the 2002 TV version of Carrie, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Writer Block, aka Track Hair Christopher, Chris View, Chris Bagel, Lindsay Filler Manier, Kyle Sargent, and Luke MC. And another thanks to Total AV for sponsoring this episode. I didn't want to have to censor the eyes bursting or the spear gun kill. Am I alone in kind of liking this movie? Is it just because I remember living in 1999 so well? Thanks everyone. Be good people.